Everyone. Uh, how many people have been to a math talk before? Okay, how many people first time? Well, really nice to see you all here. Uh, this is a, a different kind of math talk tonight. Uh, as you might know from our website, at least, or from other bulletins you've received, virtually every month we bring in a speaker who we think has something interesting to say about big ideas shaping public policy and public life. And we've been running those for almost 18 months now. We've had a wide range of people come through talking about everything from the future of education um, to the future of media. But over the course of those many months, people have said, and because they've come up at the end, they said, this is really lovely, but what is mass? What is mass? And what exactly do you guys do? Well, the whole purpose of the mass talks was just as a way to bring together a kind of collection of people who shared a, a similar range of interests. Uh, it was never to talk about what we actually do at Mass, uh, but as this is our 30th month in business, and it is uh, getting towards summer, we thought we would make an exception, and it's very kind of all of you to come out to listen to me talk about our day-to-day -day work at Mass. And that, that's what I'm gonna take the next half hour to do. Um, please uh, feel free to get a drink while I'm in midstream. You can ask a question. We're going we're gonna to have a, a, a long, hopefully quite you know, thorough Q and A. You can grill me uh, about our work at the end. Um, but the uh, washroom's over there. Uh, you can order some food. You've got some French fries. You've got some wine, some beer. We always have to thank Laura, who makes this space available to us, as part of the Jamie Kennedy Gilead Cafe. Uh, this is the sort of surrogate extension of our office, um, which, as you might know, is just at the end of this uh, laneway. So if you haven't peeked into Mass of the uh, PHQ, uh, you can do that on your way by. Um, is that good? Who are you? Who am I? My name is Peter McLeod, and I'm the principal and co-founder of Mass. And um, I really am off my game tonight because I'm normally sitting next to someone so much smarter who I just have to ask questions of. And now um, I've got to go through all of these, um, these details. So yeah, my name's Peter and I uh, helped set up uh, Mass LBP about 30 months ago. Um, we are an unusual kind of uh, organization. We've set out to have this mission of reinventing public consultation. I'm going to try and explain why. But the title of my talk this evening is Public Engagement as Public Learning. And they, those are two sets of ideas which I'm going to try and uh, draw together over the course of the presentation, over the course of the next half hour. Um, as I said, uh, Mass, we're up to 30 months here. Uh, we're an unusual kind of business. We are a social science uh, startup. Right? We aren't computer scientists, we're not engineers, we're not the kinds of people, frankly, who are supposed to be going into business. Because we're a bunch of refugees from political science departments and sociologists, and I have to acknowledge Michael Adams, who you know, trod this path well before any of us did, leaving sociology to found uh, the fabulously successful Enveronics. Nevertheless, social science startups are a bit of an anomaly. Um, more provocatively, we sometimes describe ourselves as a democracy company. And let me tell you, there's no faster way to get up the nose of some people uh, than to say, what, you make a profit off of democracy? To which I always say, yes, we sell it to the highest bidder, <laughs> right? That's not what it's about at all. But the idea of democracy and trying to redefine how we practice democracy as a society and within our organizations is very much part of what we are set up and designed to do. Um, there are three, if you had to come up with a kind of light motif for mass, there are three things that connect every single project that we do. And it has become for us a bit of a refrain. It's the idea of focusing on the citizen's experience of the state, thinking about the vitality of our public imagination, and most directly to our work, thinking about the future of responsible government. So those are themes that I'm going to keep coming back to again and again over the top course of this evening. In our 30 months, we put out three publications. Uh, the first one is called Sorted, uh, Civic Lotteries and the Future of Participation, written by Ollie Dallin. We commissioned this, actually, in our very early days. Uh, and I'm going to say a lot more about Civic Lotteries, uh, but we have copies of each of these publications, which you can take with you this evening, or you can download and send to all of your friends. 
we were commissioned to write another pamphlet shortly after, this one for the Ministry of Health. And this was about, there are these, these funny things called local health integration networks, you may have encountered them, which are meant to be uh, monitoring, funding, and evaluating local he uh, health care across the province. Well, they're one of the few government institutions that actually has a legislative mandate to engage citizens. And yet, very quickly, they realized that many of the conventional ways of engaging citizens didn't work so well. So we would try and, and, and provide some ideas to them about how they could engage citizens more successfully. And we did that by actually using three groups of citizens across the province. The last publication, The Politics of Participation, Learning from Canada's Centennial Year. This has a special place in my heart, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I think 2017 is such an important year um, in Canadian history to come. So uh, a couple more things behind the scenes. We produce the Mass Bulletin. How many people get the Mass Bulletin every month? Well, that's not bad. If you don't, you can go onto our website, add your email address, it's there. Um, we also, we have a thousand subscribers a month now, which, which really isn't very bad for, again, a kind of obscure publication about trends in governance and public policy. Uh, this is, I think, our 12th Mass Talk. We've had approximately 800 guests, and we've given well more than 30 talks right now to 10,000 people uh, across Canada, uh, the UK, and parts of Scandinavia. So for a little tiny venture uh, that started up, that shouldn't even exist, a social science startup, uh, in very quickly we, we have been trying to get word out about what we do. So beyond the publications and some of the things we do each month, this is a terrible um, a photograph. It's very, it's, it's, you can't see it very well. This is actually my living room. Uh, this is where we started. Uh, Chi Wien and John Grant and myself back in November of 2007. And uh, this is where we are now, and you can't see that particularly well, but you can see it for yourself. So this is just like mass family photos, right? Um, I'm very fortunate to have an amazing team of six people. Uh, we began Chi Wien, John Grant, and myself. Chi Wien now is our Director of Participation and Process. Chi, right, right there. Chris Ellis, our Director of Business Development. Marwena Marwa, Director of Communications. Jocelyn Trowbridge, our new Director of Research and Learning, picking up from John Grant. Dana Gronofsky, Director of Client Relations and our CSO, and you can ask her what that stands for afterwards if you're interested. We have a very funny um, uh, 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 way, uh, we, we, we're, we're funny. We have we've had 16 <laughs> interns, 16 interns in the course of 30 months, and they power mass, and we they are, there's something very special to us because they help us do what we do and all of us uh, in our own career development benefited disproportionately from different internship opportunities. Um, but just so it doesn't get too cozy in such a small office, we rarely refer to them by name. We give them a number. <laughs> and this is 16 over here, Andrew Phillips, who joined us this spring and is with us throughout the summer. So we can't be too democratic, right? I mean, a little, a little hierarchies. So mass, why is mass called mass? We get this question a lot. Well, mass comes from one of the most beautiful quotes, I think, in the history of writing about democracy, which is an injunction from Thomas Paine. And he says, there's a mass of sense lying, oh, trigger finger here. There's a mass of sense lying in a dormant state, which good government should quietly harness. And the idea there, of course, it comes from this publication called Sense, that there is a resident intelligence at work within the public at large that we simply need to find a way to modestly tap into and draw into the life of our public affairs. LBP stands for led by people. So unusually we're a private company, we're at Mass LBP Inc. We had the very um, important decision early on when we were created, would we go into the OPS and try and create an office of public engagement? That seemed like a, 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 a slow track to nowhere um, because we tried to minister to different ministries from within. We could create an NGO, which was a very fashionable thing to do at the time. But frankly, I didn't like the idea of going around and asking people to give me money for what we were doing. And I didn't want to be one of those up with citizens kind of guys. Uh, it swung it for me, I mean, it's an interesting business model, but it swung it for me when Chi, John, and I went and infiltrated uh, one of the big consulting firms, public consultations concerning the closure of a hospital uh, near the airport. And they did such a bad job of this 
that they almost had a riot. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, people were so pissed off. They did everything wrong. And we walked away that night thinking, hell, if we can't beat these people in the marketplace, we've got no business advocating for a better way of doing things. And that's when we became Mass LVP. So our job is to reinvent public consultation. I'm going to try and explain why I think this is important. It's important because a lot of public consultation is really useless. How many people have been to a useless public consultation event where they felt frustrated, where they felt as though they haven't been heard, right? That it was a waste of time, that the decision had already been made. And I think this is wrong. I don't think we can afford to conduct public consultations in this way. Um, we always talk about how in a democracy we're governed by the people. I don't think today we are governed by the people. I think we're governed by our assumptions about the people. And I want to talk about those assumptions because I think in the course of the past 50 years, we've defined the public down. We've denigrated it. And it's actually made it very difficult to conduct a mature and adult politics. So what do I mean by this? Many of our assumptions about this public actually stem from poorly designed public consultation events. It's what we're doing between elections, which is in part eroding the confidence that we have. Now, NBC made this case very easy for me last year when they produced this TV show. They are the men and women on the front lines for improving their community. Every month, the Parks Department has a public forum, and they always send me. It's pretty cool, whatever. I don't know. I don't care, but it's an honor. No one else wants to do it. You go to some sweaty rec center and get yelled at by the public. I hate the public. The public is stupid. From the people who bring you The Office, Amy Poehler in Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much for coming. What an amazing turnout. Thursday, April 9th on NBC. Pop culture can catch up to just how badly most public consultations are run and take it as their inspiration for the successor to the classic The Office. But it actually makes it safe for the rest of us to start talking about just how bad it is and how we could start making it a whole lot better. You know, we have this idea that somehow a town hall is like the paragon, the absolute platonic form of democracy. That if we just open another high school gym or library and invite people in, then we'll be good citizens, we'll be Democrats. Town halls equal democracy. But if your experience of most town hall conversations are anything like mine, they're not constructive, they're not positive. In fact, what you have are a whole bunch of people who are really pissed off. They're pissed off because they're being told that something's happening that they don't like. And so they take time off work, they take time away from their families, they show up at that sweaty rec center, they don't have the experience of speaking in front of important crowds all the time, so their, their heart is pumping. Right? And neurochemically, right, their whole hormones are charging. I'd love to see someone actually put a, a heart rate monitor to some of the people standing at those microphones to put some neural probes on the side of their face and to see what's going on. Because I'm pretty convinced that those people are clear out of their minds most of the time when they get up to that microphone. And that's not their fault. That's our fault. That's a function of really bad design, and it's not fair to put people in that kind of high stress situation simply so that they can have their say. So town halls don't equal democracy. We have to get away from the idea this is about Switzerland or you know, uh, the, the uh, you know, New England seaboard here. Town halls equal aneurysms for far too many people. Now we think, all right, let's seize the promise of new electronic technologies. We will put this online. Now that's a nice thing because we're going to reach more people, but if I'm a policymaker, I don't have to talk to anyone. It creates a buffer. It makes the process that much safer, right? Well, one of my first experiences at the University of Toronto was working for the McLuhan program back in 97, and they were trying to do on a Mac LC3 some of the first online deliberations called Pan America by Design, trying to see if they could create a commons amongst Pan American jurisdictions and talk about policy issues. I can assure you that everything we saw then hasn't changed. Most web democracy initiatives end up looking like the comment section of the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star. And there's some good reasons why. Online democracy, most of the time, is a fraud. It shouldn't be called democracy. There's nothing democratic about it. It may be populist, and that's a word I want to introduce. And populism is sometimes useful. It doesn't mean a mob, right? It means that lots of people have access. There's some important distinctions, so some vocabulary, difference between populism 
uh, meritocracy, right, and democracy. So a lot of the people who are proponents of open source software initiatives, right, they say it's more democratic because everyone can contribute. No, it's not more democratic. It's more populist. It's meritocratic. It's intensely meritocratic because it's all about the best ideas surviving. So we have to be careful with some of the language here. In any event, all of these techniques that we've been using have done a lot to change our view of exactly what the public is. Don't get me wrong. Politicians, they like individuals. They like families. We know they like families. They like communities. Love communities. But boy, they're suspicious and uncertain about the public. They don't want to admit it. But when you really get under what they're saying in, in you know, many meetings and in public documents, they, they view the public as something which is polarized, volatile, emotional, and uninformed. And that's not because they're bad people who aren't Democrats. It's that they've had so many poor experiences of encountering this ephemeral thing called the public that they're now sitting in front and having to be at the other side of that barrage. Right? So if you start to view the public as something which is polarized, volatile, emotional, and uninformed, what do you do? You don't regard it as something worth engaging. You regard it as something worth managing. It becomes an exercise in risk management. So the happy story of our 30 months at Mass LDP is that we found the public to be something different. And it shouldn't be that surprising because it's something I think we all know when we just pause to think about it for even 20 seconds. Because the public is us, right? I mean, the funny thing about the public is there's a public interest there's a public good. I'm not actually convinced there is a public like a proper noun public. If I get a big room and I invite the public in, how do we know when it's there? You know, this is not Noah's Ark. You can't count them two by two and then you're done, right? It's all about how you convene them. And so I think how you convene the public really determines the public that you get. And the public that we found across Ontario and across Canada is one that is caring, it's reasonable, it's purposeful, and it's fundamentally curious. And sadly, we don't tap into that public half enough. We have a deeply toxic relationship with the public. We all talk the game about how we're cynical about public, uh, politicians and public institutions. But rarely are we honest enough about the kind of cynicism we have that politicians and public institutions have with the public, or even as members of the public, we have about ourselves. And so that way, I think we're a house turned against itself. It's a relationship that's characterized by suspicion, apathy, and doubt. And I'm putting this in the starkest and strongest terms, maybe to provoke some debate later on. Um, I want to just take you through, these numbers always surprise people. Very, very basic stuff. I, I, I think there is a kind of bubbling crisis underneath some of this. In the last uh, municipal election on Ontario, the average voter turnout was 38.6%. Ontario is consistent with most other mature Western democracies in this regard. People don't vote in municipal elections. But what does that actually mean? Well, over the course of the past 60 years, it's declined approximately 50%. That's huge. And again, that's consistent with most mature Western democracies. We're not an anomaly here. If you have an electorate of 100 eligible voters, this is what that means. This is 100 people who can vote. That's how many people actually vote. That is, that is how many people, rather, it, sorry, it uh, takes to win. You can't see the lighter gray, I'm sorry. There's a gray goes up to about here, and then these are all the people who didn't vote. So these would be the people who did vote. You only need 40% of the people who did vote, generally in a municipal election, often less, to win. It means 14 out of 100 people are the ones actually choosing the people who represent that public. This is bananas. Bananas, right? But don't worry, because the people are always right. <laughs> now, this has got to be, like, if we can't talk honestly about a crisis of legitimacy, then at least let's talk about the erosion of mandate. Because if we talk about the erosion of mandate, we can talk about what we can do with it outside of the election space. One of the great problems with political science, and one of the things that I'm really happy not to be in the political science department anymore, is that they spend almost all of their energy focusing on two things, electoral reform and parliamentary reform. So do a thought experiment with you. Let's suppose we had electoral reform. We had Senate reform. We had any kind of parliamentary reform. You could have half women in the legislature or parliament, right? Focus on those institutions. I give the, all of those things to you tomorrow. Do you think that adds up to a renewed civic commitment? 
does that suddenly lead to a fluorescence of public uh, confidence and trust in our political institutions? I think they might be necessary. I think many of those, the, those things would be good. But I don't think they're at all sufficient to what we're after. And yet that is where 90% of energy in political science goes to when it tries to address this issue of legitimacy and mandate. So we're dealing with the decline of trust and confidence in public institutions. Is this a good problem or is it a bad problem? Well, it's a modern problem, right? We didn't go around talking about this 200 years ago. But I actually think it's a really good problem. It's, what a, it's not a poor and dumber problem. It's a richer and smarter problem. It exists because we have never been more literate, we've never been more mobile, and we've never been more connected as a society. This erosion of confidence is probably one of the best signals we have of our maturity as a society. The thing is, we need our democratic institutions to keep up. And to a lot of people, it feels as though we are running 21st century software on 18th century hardware. And the gears are just grinding, right? And they're grinding because people are saying, who speaks for me? I want to speak for me. And the whole premise of our system of representative democracy was that someone else was going to speak for you. They were going to speak for you because you couldn't speak for yourself. You couldn't speak for yourself for a number of reasons. You couldn't read. You weren't numerate. And you couldn't travel. And you couldn't talk to people who are outside of your village. One of the reasons why in Canada, as most democracies, we, we still run on an agrarian calendar is because you had MPs who would literally say, Honey, I'm off to the city to make the laws. I'll be back in the spring to plant the seeds. That was our vision of an agrarian representative democracy. We would send someone to speak for us. And then the only question was, would they do exactly what we wanted them to do this classic debate in, in representation, Burke took this up, or were we delegating to the, them to be our trustee, that they would deliberate um, in our best interests, even if they took positions on issues which, which we may have disagreed with, right? We trust them. Well, people today say, I want to feel heard, right? I want to feel heard. And, and we, it's easy to dismiss this as somehow selfish, right? Well, you can't, uh, there are too many people, right? I think it might be immature, and again, I think it's a design problem in a lot of cases, but I don't think it's actually selfish. Again, I think it's one of those positive indicators of better development as a society. And I think we actually need to stop denigrating that urge, and we need to start taking it more seriously. I describe a new sort of political axis where we're used to talking about left and right. I think a lot of the political issues, or at least a lot of the issues that really stump politicians, fall a different axis. And again, this is going to be a legible moment. It's not left and right. It's the difference between rep representation and recognition. One of the great achievements of Canadian society through its official multiculturalism policy is that we've enshrined and embedded this idea of official recognition. We do it with groups. We don't know how to do it with individuals. And it's a resolution problem. We don't know how to take it down from the group level to the individual. So when you think about the difference between representation and recognition, representation is about speaking for, recognition is speaking with. If I'm being represented, it means I'm going to, I have an abstract interest, a public interest. If it's recognition, I, I feel a direct interest. I've got something at stake. Recognition is where I'm prepared to delegate accountability. Accountability can be loose, where I want to be recognized and part of that conversation. Then I really need to demand strong accountability. I know best. I'm, I can speak for myself. I'm the best expert on this issue. And the funny thing is that I'll put two issues up here. One, you know, lots of, we're happy to delegate lots of things. This says uh, roofing for my daughter's school. The school needs to be, you know, a new roof on it. I'm probably not going to have that much to say. I'm happy to delegate. I'm happy to have my interest represented to see that a contractor is chosen through due process and that they, you know, do a good cost-benefit analysis, whether it's a 20-year roof or a 50-year roof. I probably, unless I'm a roofer, don't need to be part of that conversation. However, if the issue is whether you're going to close my daughter's school, I don't care how many PhDs you've got. I don't care how many economists are there. I don't care how many experts can tell me that this is better for the system as a whole. I'm going to, be, I'm going to want to be part of that conversation. I'm going to demand to be part of that conversation. And it's a really hard thing for our 108 MPPs 
to be there recognizing all of those interests, all clamoring to have their say, not only on issues like that, but of course the majority of issues, municipal infrastructure, child care, um, social assistance, what else we got here? Transportation. Transportation and uh, new schools and hospitals, right? So like much of the work in a business of politics takes place at that end of the axis, and yet our mechanisms for working with people um, all fall over here. This is a problem. Uh, I, 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 the fellow who's the, the chief planner for Metro Vancouver said this to me in the spring. It was actually part of the 1960 Stop the Spadine Expressway movement. How many people here? Some, yeah, I'm sure there are a few. So he said, you know, we really figured out in the 1960s how to use citizens, how to use citizen power to stop things, right? But we don't know how to work with citizens to start things. And that's really interesting. I mean, citizens know how to bind themselves together in NGOs and create Facebook pages and use all the communications that are available to them in highly asymmetrical ways to push their point of view. But they don't do it with government. They do it against government. This is a really interesting challenge. What would it mean to be able to work with citizens to start things? We like to use aphorisms a lot at mass because it kind of compresses what we're thinking and what we know. And I'll come to it later on, but we like to say, um, uh, it's, it's not that we ask too much of people, it's that we ask too little. Or at least that we ask the wrong thing. We ask people for what's in their pocketbooks, but we ask for very little else. We certainly don't ask them to start things with us. In Switzerland, back in uh, about 15 years ago, they were trying to decide where to site nuclear waste dumps. There was going to be a national referendum, and some psychologists went around and polled citizens who were very well informed. And they said, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Astonishingly, 50% of the citizens said yes. They knew it or thought it was dangerous. They thought it would reduce their property values, but it had to go somewhere, and they had responsibilities as citizens. The psychologist asked other people a slightly different question. They said, if we paid you six weeks' salary every year, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Two reasons. It's my responsibility, and I'm getting paid. Instead of 50% saying yes, 25% said yes. What happens is that the second this the introduction of the incentive gets us so that instead of asking what is my responsibility, all we ask is what serves my interests. When incentives... Barry Schwartz, Paradox and Choice. Watch the whole video with Ted. This is, I think, one of the most interesting studies, and it's been replicated on other issues and in other countries. Um, you might say, yes, Switzerland is a little special. <laughs> Switzerland is a little special. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting things in Switzerland is that they did first build that public consensus that they would have nuclear power in the first place. And for them, that was all about energy independence. And so then they could have a mature conversation about what the implications of it would be. But it points to this, I think, very important issue that too often we appeal to people's sense of self-interest and we forget to appeal to their sense of public interest. And the costs of failing to do this are incalculable. What we have to do when it comes to working in the space between elections is to try and rebalance self-interest, group interest, and public interest. So many times I meet people who say, you know, I need to consult with the public, but it's going to be overrun by stakeholders, right? And stakeholders have become very savvy at running the game. And then what does it become? It just becomes a game. Right? A pantomime, a kabuki. Uh, we're going to pretend to hear you, and you're going to pretend to tell us something new. <laughs> right? And back and forth it goes. All right. So we all accept that technological innovation is really important to the well-being of our economy. And increasingly, we're prepared to accept that social innovation is important for our general well-being. I think we need to be doing so much more to invest in democratic innovation so we can tap that massive quiet sense lying dormant in the population and make them co-participants in the kinds of solutions that we need to reach. So if I had to put together my democratic innovation agenda, the three things I'd put on, it's very simple. We need better ways to convene citizens. 
and to make recommendations or take decisions. I mean, it's infantile the way most organizations and certainly government convene citizens, right? They take out an ad in a paper. They send a note around to a whole bunch of organizations with whom they already have a friendly relationship. We need better ways to share information. One of the, the funny things about government is that it's the only part of the society that seems not to have benefited disproportionately from the advent of the internet, right? Like organizations left and right are creating, I mean, hell, we've got our thousand people on the mass bulletin. Government has two problems right now. It doesn't know where most of its citizens are. I mean that literally. And secondly, it doesn't have any way to communicate with them directly um, in a way that respects the cost curve that the internet has made possible. Right? Third thing is we need better ways to unlock initiative and local problem solving. And that you can talk for hours about. So I think there are four things that you should expect from any good engagement. So I'm kind of segueing into the, you know, our view of how you do engagement well. Um, yes, it has to produce useful recommendations. That's really important. And most recommendations you get out of public consultations aren't particularly useful. So it's a simple thing to say, but it's a high bar. The second thing is that as a dividend paid of every, um, I wouldn't just say public consultation or engagement, but interaction with the public, it ought to enhance the transparency and institutional trust that is paid to that organization. We have a funny uh, term which we call democratic fitness. We think it should augment democratic fitness. What do I mean by that? It's the Erin Brockovich School of Public Engagement. Remember Erin Brockovich? She didn't know how a bill became law. She didn't know where Senator was. She was a woman who had an inside sense of moral courage and enough smarts to figure out what she needed to learn to make a difference. A lot of people talk about the importance of civic literacy, knowing who the first prime minister was. I think that matters, but I think you can trust people to figure that out when they feel as though they've got something meaningful to do. And giving people that sense of agency, I think, is an important dividend paid for this work. The last is organizational learning. So this is kind of, you know, read Peter Senge here, right? But his point is important. Like, engagement has to go two ways. And so you can't walk away from some kind of encounter uh, without it changing you every bit as much as it ought to change. Um, the worldview of the people who have been involved. So here's some aphorisms that are a bit counterintuitive. The first is don't listen to what people are saying, listen to what they are trying to tell you, right? Often people have trouble expressing what is at the core of their concern. We know this from our personal relationships, yes? Ooh. Say yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't ask people what they think. Well, one of the worst things you can do, we found, is to ask people what they think. It's almost irrelevant. When we convene citizens for the first time, I pop in and I say, hey, this is so important. We're so grateful for the time that you're giving us over the course of the next three, four, five, six Saturdays. But actually, I don't care what you think. And everybody. Well, obviously, I'm sympathetic. I care. I say, bring your life experience to bear. But democracy isn't just the aggregate of individual interests. You're not just here to press your case. You're actually here to do the harder task of being a democratic citizen. And that is to perform the leap of democratic imagination, which is no more complicated than trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. To try, uh, to me, democracy is about applied empathy, right? It's about understanding the needs and interests of someone who's totally unlike you, and being able to use your voice to represent their needs and to have them re recognize your voice as an effective proxy for their own. And that is one of the rare privileges that our society can give to its citizens. And I tell you, as soon as you explain that, it does two things. One, it makes the person feel special, because now they've got a job to do. They've really got a reason for being here. The second thing is it shifts them into a space of learning. That's what I mean, public engagement is public learning. Because now suddenly they're thinking, how the, how the hell do I rep, you know, speak for that person? I know nothing about them. It just opens them up. It just opens them up, thinking about what those other needs might be. So if you're designing for engagement, there are four things that I think are really important to ask yourself. One, who's in the room and how do they get there? Right? I'll talk more about the civic lottery process in a moment. Are you asking for their opinion? Or are you asking to represent the views of others? 
is there a real task? Right? You can say, uh, so what do you think? Actually, you're off on two scores when you ask people what they think. Um, one, because it's not that interesting just here. They think on the top, for reasons I've explained. But two, because um, that's just sticking your finger in the wind. And frankly, there, there are faster, better ways to do that than to go to the trouble of convening people for a conversation. At the end of the day, we're Canadians. We are hard-headed northerners who don't like talk for the sake of talk. We like to get stuff done. So give us something real to do. Let's not fake it. If there's a real task in front of people, they rise to the occasion, they'll give you more than you ever expected. And lastly, don't be taken in with this idea that the public actually knows what's best. The public has judgment. It doesn't necessarily have knowledge. And there's an important distinction there. We all have opinions about lots of things. I've got opinions about, should I know nothing about? <laughs> right? But it doesn't mean I'm mean curious. And in fact, I think most people would like to replace their ignorance with information. Uh, but a while ago, government got out of the meaning-making business. It got out of the business of learning and learning with citizens. And I think there's a lot that could be done to get that back. I was thinking, actually, I was in Chicago last week. I was traveling through their public transit system. In one of their stations, it was this beautiful display that had all been made out of tile work that showed all of the geologic era, eras from pre-Cambrian to Paleozoic. And I thought, if I passed that every day, I would get that over time. Now, of course, in the U.S., they have this, you know, debate around this thing called evolution. Uh, <laughs> but this may have, this may help. You know, why isn't the uh, uh, TTC station at King Street, you know, programmed by the Toronto Science Center? Why isn't it programmed by Health Canada so it's got the Canada Health Guide pyramid thing brought to life for us? Why don't we use our public space for public learning? Not in a didactic, tedious way. People like to learn. People are curious. Tap into it. Anyway, we're fortunate because in all of our work we've been drawing, as I think many of you know, on a made in Ontario, made in Canada model. And these, to me, are the best numbers of Canadian democracy. You'll remember we had something called a Citizens Assembly on Electoral Reform. It took place in 2006 and 7. The government of Ontario, as a, as a, I mean, it took a flyer on this. It had seen it done in BC, but never before in Canadian history, and frankly, never before in any other country. And the government sent out 100,000 envelopes addressed to citizens randomly distributed across the province that said, hey, I'd like you to serve your community, to spend 16 weekends over the course of eight months, to travel from your riding to a windowless room at York University, not to talk about the environment or health care or jobs, any of the things you might care about, but something we care about, something as totally obscure as electoral reform. And the amazing thing is that of the 100,000 people who got that invitation, 7,000 people volunteered. That is off the charts. And just imagine if they had asked for people to come, not to spend 16 weekends, but maybe four, <laughs> to talk about jobs, or a green economy, or health care. How many people would have made the time then? Tens of thousands of people would have volunteered to have been a part of that. Ultimately, 103 people were randomly selected, uh, half men, half women, representing each riding in the province, then there were 103. This is what they look like. They look like you and me. Uh, we got really tired of answering questions about demographic profile. We made a poster. You can see it in our office. We'll give you a copy of it. Uh, that shows that in every dimension, from income to ethnicity to tenure of citizenship, uh, these people are so much closer to the actual demographic profile of Ontario than the Ontario legislature. Uh, it's laughable. Um, this is where they met, the windowless room at York University, the moot court. This is where they deliberated, there's the television cameras or for TVO. Uh, this was one of the most poignant and important moments of the Citizens' Assembly. It happened midway through, not at the end. Direct, the academic director, Jonathan Rose, he decided that he could have a graduation ceremony. He said, listen, as, with the, 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 uh, as is proportionate to the Ontario population, many of our assembly members didn't graduate high school. And they've just completed virtually the same amount of learning that I ask my first year master's students to do when they take Canadian politics course, right? They've done, by that point, eight weeks of learning and listening to international experts. We need a graduation ceremony. People said there wasn't time. So we need a graduation ceremony. And they made time for it. 
And one of the members came up to him that evening and said, you know, I never graduated high school. And it was a big event for my family this past spring because we all went to watch my daughter graduate. But I asked her to come this weekend so she could watch her mother graduate too. Wow. Wow. A public consultation about electoral reform does that? Who would have ever put that into the original blueprint that one of the outcomes or dividends paid from this process would be that sense? That's what I mean by democratic fitness. That's what I mean by agency. And she felt greater pride could share that with her family and her friends. So how do you define engagement? One of the joys of, again, of not being a political science is that I don't have to come up with really tedious definitions of things. I get to go with my gut. It's about eyes lining up. And you can't see it here, but these are very beautiful people. And you know it. You know when you're in a room when people are engaged. And we should trust our gut more um, when we end up going out, running consultations, and we see that people are When you define engagement as learning, you begin to redefine politics as learning. And that, that's, I think, the big prize here. So a Made in Ontario model continues to evolve. We decided to start calling this whole process of sending out letters civic lotteries. We've now done um, 10 of these across the country, two in BC, eight in Ontario. That's 50,000 Canadians who received one of our invitations, asking them from two, three, four, five, six Saturdays to think about everything from, for national defense, um, the bioremediation of military waste, or as we refer to it in the office, bugs eating bombs, uh, to their comfort level with advanced genomics research, uh, to how you cut $1.4 million in order to balance a structural deficit in a hospital, to how you set the long-term strategic plan for a uh, region's uh, uh, health system. So we send out 5,000 letters. They look like this. You can look at them later. 24 to 36 people are randomly selected from amongst the respondents. We have a 4 to 7 percent response rate. On average, we get about 250 respondents. So we're selecting 24 to 36 of them. We select for only three criteria, gender, age, and geography, by which I mean population intensity. Um, you don't need to select for education, ethnicity, tenure, citizenship. Those things come out in the wash. The interesting thing about this it is as interesting to rich as to poor, as to well-educated, to poorly educated, to new Canadians as to old Canadians. And that's something I think we should feel good about as Canadians as well. So this is what the, uh, the materials look like. We take incredible amount of care in how we write and frame this letter. It's all about service. It's all about the opportunity to become better informed and have a real say. Uh, there are five stages to it. It's convening, learning. We go, we consult with the wider public. It's one of the neatest parts of the whole process. We hold what we call a public roundtable meeting. We get out of the space, the members of the reference panel, they end up taking the seat and they chair small roundtables. So the public comes in and they can't point to that authority at the front of the room because it's someone just like them who's giving up their time to think about this issue on their behalf. Totally changes the dynamic of the situation. Uh, and they are very fast at that point, the members of the panel, to sniff out any kind of undue influence, right? That someone had an agenda in the room. It all becomes very, very transparent. There's a deliberation exercise and ultimately recommendations are made. We call them reference panels, citizen reference panels, to drive home the point, which I think was clouded by the citizens' assembly, that this isn't about replacing elected representatives. Elected representatives have too much to do, in my opinion. They need to be able to refer some issues to their fellow citizens to do the thinking for them and refer back advice. But it's not about challenging their authority. It's a complementary relationship. And because we went directly to referendum, I think that got lost. If it had been mine to do with the Citizens Assembly, I'd have had them refer the issue back to the floor of the legislature like a royal commission. And then we could have watched the NPP squirm. So there are three kinds of learning that have to go on. One is procedural, one is about values, right? People have to be able to understand the process they're a part of, how it's working. They then have to be able to develop a values framework to know uh, how they can assess the information that they're being presented with. All of that is quite intensive before you even get to the subject matter at hand. Uh, we've done a, a bunch of these. I want to talk just briefly with Northumberland Hills Hospital. Uh, in fact, just today in Northumberland News, one of the members, because it's been controversial since the report came out, published an exceptional op-ed 
where he talked about his experience, and he talked about how some of the people who disagreed with it haven't put forward credible solutions. And I think it's a conversation that is actually, it, it has now come to balance in that community, um, and, uh, and has proven to be a very effective model. Uh, there are lots of details in it. I don't want to go into all of these steps because I know I'm going on already at this point. Uh, we go through the civic order, orientations, values, prioritizing. Knowing how to prioritize is actually a really hard task. It's a skill, prioritizing, right? And, and meshing values with priorities is, is, is not the most of we do it. For your family, you have to decide where you're going to go for holiday. Someone says, I want something adventurous. Someone says, I want something relaxing. Those are two values. And you use those to then scrutinize the range of options that might be in front of you. But again, we don't put this into practice. It's not intuitive. Now, these photos are going to be painful for you to see. They're, they're, they're beautiful, and that's why I always try and include photos. But these are quotes from people who were part of the NHA per process. We brought them together five times? Five, five Saturdays. Between October and Christmas, right? Uh, to, and, and one in 12 households in Port Hope and Coburg got a, a letter inviting them to participate. So a great communications tool to saturate that community with information about the very real challenge that a hospital faced. I refer to Port Hope and Coburg as kind of the Montagues and Capulets of Eastern Ontario. I mean, these are two communities that don't get along. Um, so forging a conversation where they would be well represented and able to participate was pretty essential. We developed all of these cards. We, 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 we think more like adult educators, more and more, than we do about facilitators, right? And it's about creating materials so that people are kinesthetic, auditory, visual learners, all this stuff. They have to be able to manipulate as they learn. So these are people just in these five Saturdays. This is so much more complex than I realized. You know, the funny thing about healthcare in this province is that everyone has an opinion about it, right? And everyone thinks they're an expert, uh, but they're also really anxious about it. And they're anxious about it because they don't understand it. And once they start to understand a little bit of it, they appreciate why wait times are longer than they might like them to be, why the ALC problem is jamming up so many beds. And it doesn't make them happy, but boy, it drains the swamp of all that anxiety. I want to make sure there's a health system for my grandchildren. Tom Clausen, head of the OHA, we bring in you know, really impressive experts who know how to speak with the public. Uh, 600 slides, 12 presentations, 40 hours uh, they put into this. It was serious information, guided by values, informed by the wider community. That's a round table taking place. Learning through dialogue. You went to this table if you want to talk about public trust. Resolving differences. Learning to prioritize. Cooperative acts. Local leadership. Really important. Tough choices getting made. And the last bit, as we learned from the Citizens Assembly, recognition. We, we make very liberal use of the government of Ontario's logo. Uh, and I actually was in a meeting with the Premier this morning and said as much, and he had a kind of like, stunned look on his face. But we use it to make uh, certificates of public uh, uh, appreciation. Anyway, happily, the Minister of Health happens to agree, because when the NHH issue of cutting services uh, was raised by the head of the NDP last month in April, uh, she said, you know, it's right, and it's a hard choice, but we're not the ones who made it community did, and I think other hospitals would be well advised to explore using a process just like this to address their long-term structural issues as well. So we've learned through our 30 months of mass some pretty obvious things. That government isn't a technical institution, it's a social institution. That citizens need to touch the state. They did a longitudinal study, came out last year, said that citizens in the U.S. who, you know, jury service is compulsory, are more likely as a result of the participation in the justice system, become more active and engaged citizens. That's a really interesting finding. The more likely to become volunteers, the more likely to uh, donate, uh, give up their time, etc. And I think this actually starts to fill a gap in Bob Putnam's big idea around social capital. And I don't want to presume to insert anything into Bob Putnam's thinking, but there's one of the things that Bob Putnam doesn't talk about. Bob Putnam wrote the book Bowling Alone, talked about the erosion of trust and confidence in public institutions, and said it's, it's because we're, we're, we're not participating in the full civic life of our communities as we once did. He used the idea of bowling leagues and, and the decline in membership of all these organizations. He said there are two kinds of social capital. There is bonding capital, and that makes us friends. But if we just become friends and we don't connect with other groups of friends, then we're highly tribal. So highly functioning societies 
they not only bond individuals together, they put those individuals together in groups, in leagues, is the way to think about it. We're all kind of, we might be on a team, but we're going to play by the same rules as part of the league. And so you want to do things to augment the, the bonding and bridging capital. Here's, a, here's another one I would like to insert. It's any of binding. Because he doesn't say anything that really explains the decline of confidence in the state. I think part of it's a matter of scale. It wasn't so long ago that you could get people together in a town hall. It wasn't so long ago that all of us knew someone who worked in the public sector, or knew someone who might have been a reeve, a councillor, a mayor, an MPP. Right? You just have to look at the numbers in Canadian society. The perverse thing about Canada is the larger we get, the fewer politicians we have. We have fewer politicians by 30 in Ontario today than we had 15 years ago. Right? And it's a trend. Look at governance in Toronto. I'd argue one of the reasons that we're such a successful multicultural society is because of the granularity of governance that we have. We actually had enough councillors out there taking the temperature of all these diverse communities in a way that's harder for them to do now that they're part of Metro, each trying to represent hundreds of thousands of people. So we know how to bind people through compulsory means. We can do it through juries, military, schooling, right? Uh, we know how to do it through voluntary means. We invite people to join political parties. Most people don't community organizations and do good works. I think the state needs to be much more proactive about inviting people to take a seat at the table. We can reverse the democratic deficit if we start focusing on democratic dividends paid out not just through engagement, but through every interaction. And that can lead to greater democratic fitness. Mandates don't come from elections. That's to go back to the beginning when you've got 14 people out of 100 actually giving you your mandate. They don't come from elections. That's to dispense with this illusion. What elections give you are the opportunities of office to create mandates by working with people. The true privilege of democratic citizenship in that way doesn't end with the vote. We shouldn't be confused that it does, it begins there. And it's the opportunity to speak and represent on behalf of others. It's our elected politicians who are actually enjoying the greatest privilege of democratic citizenship. But we need to devolve it out to a much wider range of citizens. Not so that we're all in office all the time, but like with the judicial system, once, twice in our lives, we have the opportunity to serve. People want to say, but they're willing to serve. The problem isn't that we ask too much, but too little. So what else? Well, at last we've been working, and I'm going to start to wind up here. We've been working on some things beyond all of this um, work around citizen reference panels and civic lotteries. We've looked at how you can bring a school for social entrepreneurship to Toronto. Um, you're going to be hearing a lot more about the second thing over the course of the next year, the International Festival of Learning based on the Hate Festival in the UK. We've been working with our friends in Burlington on municipal democratic reform. Um, and then, then I saw this. A couple of years ago, I started noticing that there are centennial symbols uh, scattered all across this country and they are emblazoned into our sidewalks. And then I started hearing from some of our citizen panels that if they were of a certain age, uh, they all would want to talk about Centennial because we talk about trust and confidence in government. They said, you know, I remember as a child going to Expo, or I remember how excited my parents were. And it was a time when people historically did have a lot more confidence in when Canada was punching above its weight. It made me very curious to understand exactly what Centennial was. Um, there were only four books written about it, one of our, one of, one of which is the one we've published. Pierre Bird put out a book called 1967, Canada's Last Good Year. He wrote it in 97, which was of course two years after the Quebec referendum and in the midst of some of the steepest cuts to public spending in a generation. And by contrast, you better believe that the centennial year shone pretty bright. But it got him into a lot of trouble when he published that because the second printing came out and changed the title, Canada's Turning Point. And both of them, I think, are really powerful and we should keep them in mind. We got curious about exactly what the centennial was. We got curious about the legacy of great Torontonians like Roby Kidd, Bruce Kidd's dad, who was the first Canadian to get a PhD in adult education, who convened the first meeting in 1957, 10 years before the centennial to have a big think with civic associations, and learned that it wasn't government that created centennial, it was citizens. And then we did the very simple math and realized that, oh, we're only seven years away from our next big year, what could be Canada's next great turning point. We forget that in the space of two minority governments, we did the Canada Pension Plan, we did Medicare, we did social insurance, we amalgamated the military, we built the Montreal Metro, we gave ourselves the Order of Canada, the flag, and an anthem. And we did a good deal more besides. So what was that all about? That was about 
having a sense of public imagination, and it began well before. So we decided that since no one else was doing, we'd do it, and we would bring together 300 senior public servants, business leaders, community leaders to Ottawa for two days this past March to have the first big think about imagining and planning Canada sesquicentennial to fire the starter's pistol on this issue, not because we wanted anything to do with owning it, but simply to get other people working away at it. We brought them together. We had everyone from the Chief Justice, Beverly McLaughlin, I should say. This had nothing to do with Michael Ignatius' 5 conference, which also had nothing to do with the sesquicentennial, and everything to do with just taking a long-term policy, which I think was constructive, but different. Uh, so we had everyone from Rock Carrier to uh, Romeo um, uh, Dallaire to um, uh, to Peter Ackroyd, who was Dan Ackroyd's father and was the director of communications for the Centennial. A magical man who's now 95 and almost blind. He got up there at the podium and told the story of how you can bring a country to life. Um, so what's ahead for us at Mass? Well, um, over the course of the next year or two, there are a couple of issues that are just burning up. One is the issue of income inequality. If you haven't read The Spirit of <coughs> Why Equality Matters, you have to read it. It's probably the most important book of social science put out in a decade. And it has one important thing that we need to understand as Canadians. That of OECD countries, Canada is the country which is becoming most unequal the fastest. And the correlation has now been properly made between everything from obesity to violence. That it is biggest correlate is the gap between rich and poor, and that gap is growing. And good luck letting it grow if you live in a mass immigration society. Good luck finding a consensus on things like public transit or public health care, because you're all going to need very different things from that society. We don't like the idea of two-tier health care. Wait till you get a taste of a two-tier Canada. The second is public space for public learning. I talked already about the uh, transit system, the Canada Food Guide. I want to turn the CN Tower with its fancy light system into a giant energy barometer. Uh, I want it, like the Canada Life Tower, to show us in real time what the province's load is. Um, this part of our, our thinking around the sesquicentennial, multiculturalism, um, 1967 marked the change from geography defining Canada's identity to demography driving it. It's about to change again. We have a generation of people, a third of the country has been born abroad since 1967. But we're no longer a country of immigrants, we're a country of emigrants. Uh, more than Atlantic Canada, more than the prairies, live abroad. 2.8 million Canadians, it's the secret province. We do nothing for them. After five years, you lose the right to vote, we don't tax them. We do nothing to tap that intelligence. We do nothing to tap that network of people who have an affiliation and affinity for this country once they leave. And they are part of the dual passport generation. And we need to find a way. And this will be as much of a challenge for us to digest as multiculturalism was in the 60s. We will try to find Canadian-ness more rigidly. We will try and make them different than us. But if we recognize them as perhaps one of our greatest assets, I think we'll lead the rest of the world in this transition to a more global, multinational perspective. Um, we put out this document, Chris will give you a copy on the way up, called Work for What You Wish For. Projects that we'd love to take on. It's our screwy way of doing business development. We dream up things and then we hope people will come and pay us to do them. Uh, we want to work with the union to renew their internal democratic structures. I won't offer any editorial comments. Uh, we want to stage a public discussion on end of life care. That's a tough one. Uh, it is in, uh, what are the stats? It is in your last 30 days, right, that you spend sort of 90% of your lifetime take uh, from the public system. And we haven't had a big mature discussion. That is one of the major drivers of cost in the public health system. This isn't about rationing. This isn't about pulling the plug on grandma. It's about none of these things. Um, but you can talk to the people at UHN right now about the proportion of, uh, of their budget, which goes to dealing with situations because there's just there hasn't been any preparation of dealing with those critical last weeks and months of life. Uh, we want to assist a country in the transition to democracy. There's an audacious one. Uh, because we actually think that a lot of this work is about creating cultures of citizenship. Uh, it is about providing recommendations, but it's actually before. I think it's ridiculous that we go into foreign countries and we think, here's your parliamentary democratic system, go. <laughs> right? You never voted on anything in your life. You don't believe necessarily in the quality of people to make a contribution. And we want to uh, reinvent a provincial budget consultation process because if you really want an instance of a failed way of connecting with the people, uh, visit that roadshow next time it comes to town. Um, 
ultimately, our view of Mass is one where we take politics to be about public learning, uh, where we're all co-learners, and, and that is the basis of our commitment to one another as citizens, and ultimately to our ability uh, to make decisions together and uh, achieve a more just society. Thank you.